Uh, if you are new here, I just want to especially say welcome, because so am I. Uh, so you're, you're in good company this morning. Uh, Andy, how am I doing? Am I lined up? All right. Well, uh, it's so good to be here once again, our second Sunday here. Um, and it's so fun to see a new, a new team of leaders just eager and ready to start investing into the youth in this church and into this community as well. Um, I, I wanted to begin this morning actually with some statistics. Any statistics fans here? Anyone? Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a market research firm who's well-respected called the Barna Group. And the Barna Group specializes in the area of religious life and behavior in America. And not too long ago, they did a, a massive study uh, where they, they took a group of Christians, not yet followers of Jesus, uh, and they presented two lists of characteristics. And they asked this group of non-Christians uh, to just name what are the characteristics that describe Christians. One group, one list was negative, one list was positive. And, uh, and any, any guesses what the most common characteristic named to describe Christians was? No. Hip, did I hear hypocrite? Judgment? I mean, you, got, you guys are spot on. It, it was judgmental. 87% of those surveyed said that Christians are judgmental. Now, someone listening could say, yeah, but, but those, are, those are people who are not Christians, and so they're a little biased, right? Well, the same question was asked of a large group of Christians. <laughs> and while the number is slightly lower, 50% of Christians said that Christians are judgmental. That's half. Now, now we all know that perception doesn't necessarily define reality, right? Uh, we, we know that. Uh, I also think it's a little bit of a, just a fun irony that, that uh, what the statistic tells us is there are people who are passing judgment on other people for being judgmental. I, I just think that's kind of fun. Um, but at the very least, though, at the very least, if you are at all like I am concerned for the witness of the church in North America, then statistics like this should in some way snag your attention. They should in some way at the very least give us pause and reason to reflect and to maybe evaluate. In our text this morning, Jesus very clearly and very emphatically says, do not judge. And what I'd like to do this morning, wherever you find yourself, whether you've been following Jesus longer than I've been alive, uh, or if you're here this morning and you're like, I don't know what I think about this whole Jesus or church thing, and you're a bit skeptical, like where, wherever you find yourself in that spectrum, I want to invite you along with me to, to listen to and learn from Jesus. Because if, if we listen to Jesus this morning, I promise, if we take to heart what he says as the power to transform us at the deepest levels of our being. If you're a note taker, this is the part where I, I tell you what the outline is. If, if we're listening this morning, what we'll find is that Jesus clarifies for us what he means when he says, do not judge. And then Jesus teaches us how not to judge and and finally, Jesus models the way. For us, he clarifies what he means, he teaches us how, and he models the way. Our, our text for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. If you have a Bible, open it up, or a Bible app, open it up. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. This is God's word for God's people. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. God's word for God's people. Will you pray with me? Father, we, we pause now and we first want to say thank you for, for the fact that you are a God who speaks to us. You speak in many ways, but you especially speak to us through the scriptures. When we, when we read the words of scripture and listen, we are reading and listening to your voice. We thank you that you have not only inspired these words, but you've preserved them for so long. And we ask that these words would not fall on deaf ears or hearts this morning, that we would not leave this morning unchanged. Thank you. We love you too. And we pray in your son's name, Father, and by your spirit. Amen. (coughs) Mic up. Mic up. Okay, let's see. Thank you, Bill. Is that better? Yeah. All right. The whole back row is like, I have no idea what he's been talking about. <laughs> uh, we, we begin this morning with, with this very simple command. This very simple command, right? Do not judge. But as soon as we say that, we have to ask the question. The question begs itself, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean not to judge someone? And, and it may be helpful to, to say, at least according to our friends at Merriam-Webster, what exactly the word judge means. So today, when we use the word judge, what we mean is to form an opinion about through careful weighing of evidence and testing of premises. In other words, to judge is to submit a verdict. It's, it's, to, it's to draw a conclusion about someone, whether that be their behavior, whether that be the words that they say, the way that they dress, their ideas, whatever it might be. It's to draw a conclusion about someone. It's in some way to discern the difference between right and wrong. It's to in some way, in some way discern the difference between truth and error. This is what it means to judge. And, and the reality is, is we do this all the time. Like if you are a teacher or a manager, if you manage people, you are constantly making judgments. It's literally a part of your job. Like if you are a parent, you are a judge. That's part of your vocation as a parent to judge the behavior of your children. Uh, j- just the other day, I, I was in the other room, and I heard this blood-curdling scream. And, uh, and I ran into the room, and my daughter was running toward me with blood coming down from her nose. And her brother was in the back of the room, behind a couch, peeking up, <laughs> just kind of watching to see what would happen. Uh, and if, so, of course, I cleaned her up. I wiped the blood off. This was the first bloody nose as a result of a sibling conflict. Not bad. She's four. We've gone a long ways. Uh, but I cleaned her up. And then, and then what was my job after caring for her? My job was to judge, to bring truth, to figure out, okay, so what happened here? What happened here? What happened here that was wrong, that was unjust? And to, to bring judgment. And that's, that's what healthy parents do. We judge. And so when Jesus says, do not judge, does he mean that we are not to ever discern the difference between right and wrong, that which is just and that which is unjust, that which is true and that which is in error, that which is right and that which is wrong? Is this what Jesus means when he says, do not judge? Well, if it is what he meant, it would be odd. And it would be odd for a couple reasons. For starters, Jesus himself often judges people. 
Now, that might sound weird, but you just read a chapter or two earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus has some pretty strong words for the religious leaders of his day. He calls them hypocrites. And just to give one example, he calls them out on the way that they pray. He says, don't pray like the hypocrites. They stand on the street corners, places where everyone can see them, and they have these fancy prayers. And, and what Jesus is doing is he's exposing the condition of their heart, and he's saying they're doing the right things for the wrong reasons. They care more about what people think of them than about what God thinks of them. And then later in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, we find Jesus also saying something interesting. He gives instructions as to what to do when you have discerned that a brother or sister, someone in your community, has done something wrong. He actually gives instructions. It's, it's a very healthy and simple and profound uh, confrontation model, actually. But what does he say in Matthew 18? He says, if your brother or sister sins, don't judge them. Leave them alone to each his own. Right? Oh, wait, no, that, sorry. That's not what he says. Uh, he says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you. And then he lays out this really healthy process for healthily confronting one another. And then, so not only when we look at Jesus, do we see that in some sense, passing judgment, discerning between that which is right and wrong, is a good and healthy part of a mature life. But I think common sense tells us this as well. Uh, if you were to go out in the parking lot after the congregational meeting today and, and found me out there with a baseball bat, bashing the windows of your car in, uh, I imagine after a moment of shock, you would say something like, Michael, what are you doing? This is awful. Stop doing this. And if, and if I said, whoa, 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 like, are you judging me? Like, who are you to judge me? Right? That is common sense. Of course, when Jesus says, do not judge, he doesn't mean that we are never, ever to, to discern and even express at times the difference between right and wrong, truth and error, just and unjust things. But if that's not what Jesus means, what does he mean? Well, like a good teacher, Jesus gives an illustration. He clarifies for us what he means when he says, do not judge. And this is what he says. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank or some translations say log I like the word two by four in your own eye how can you say to your brother let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye do you see what he's saying what Jesus is saying is why is it that you notice all the little faults and failures of others and yet somehow so conveniently ignore or even dismiss the darkness, the brokenness, the sin within your own heart. This is what Jesus is saying. When Jesus says do not judge, he's not saying you, you must never discern the difference between right and wrong. He's actually doing something much more spiritually uncomfortable. He's actually doing something much more spiritually subversive. He's exposing a tendency in the heart of each and every one of us. He's exposing a tendency in the fallen human heart, a tendency that exaggerates the faults and failures of others while minimizing our own. He's pulling the veil back and saying, why, why don't you take a look at your own heart? And this is uncomfortable, right? This is not easy. It's not easy. It's not comfortable to follow Jesus, to actually take the things that he says seriously. Because if we're honest, we all do this. 
Like we, we all have this, this tendency to, when it comes to other people's faults and failures, we've got 20-20 vision. But when it comes to the junk in my own heart, when it comes to those dark corners that I, I'd prefer not to shine the flashlight on, uh, I can be pretty dismissive. And, and we learn this tendency at an extremely young age, don't we? Uh, I, I, back to the story with the bloody nose. Uh, I, after calming my daughter down, I, I sat down with my son and I said, Daniel, okay, what, like, what, what did you do? And, and he said, well, well, Esther hit me first. And I said, oh, okay, okay, well, that's not right. She should not have done this. But what, what did you do? And I knew what he did. He punched his sister in the face, right? <laughs> so, but I said, Daniel, what did you do? Well, well, Esther took my toy. Okay, great, Daniel. That, that, that was not right. But what did you do? Well, Esther, no, Daniel, you, right? We develop at such a young age this, this tendency, this proclivity to be experts in the faults and failures of others and yet to be so dismissive and ignore our own. I'm guilty of this. And that this is what Jesus is saying when he says, do not judge. He's, he's doing something much more uncomfortable, much more subversive than simply saying, you must never discern the difference between right and wrong. He's, he's saying, take a look at your own heart. Be the first one to confess. I mean, think of, imagine what this would do to a marriage. This is what Jesus is saying. And, and here's the reality. Like, if, if you go to a grocery store today, do they, I was just thinking about this, do they still have magazine racks at the checkout lines? They, I mean, I don't, I don't know if they still, okay, so they still have magazine racks. So whether you, you know, buy magazines there or just scroll on BuzzFeed, whatever it is, uh, if you go through a checkout line, you will see that there's an entire industry in our society that feeds off of our fascination with the faults and failures and pain of others. Celebrity magazines. There's an entire industry devoted just to this one thing. And at some point, we have to ask ourselves, to what degree is our fascination with the faults, failures, sins, and pain of others, really just a way of avoiding our own. See, Jesus clarifies for us what he means when he says, do not judge. It doesn't mean do not discern the difference between that which is just and unjust. It's something, something much more troubling much more uncomfortable, and yet much more profound. It's an invitation to look inward, an invitation to evaluate one's own heart before ever thinking about speaking towards someone else's. So Jesus clarifies what he means. But, but he not only clarifies in the text this morning, he, he, he then teaches us how to do it. He teaches us how not to judge. And here are the instructions that he gives. He's very practical. He says, first, take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, in other words, he's saying, first, evaluate your own heart. First, confess your own sin. First, own your own junk. This is the first thing that should happen. This is an attitude of the heart. This is an attitude of the spirit that Jesus is inviting anyone who would call themselves a follower to cultivate. And it's really hard. It's really hard to do. Jesus tells this beautiful story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, it's one of my favorite parables that Jesus tells. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. 
And he, and he sets up this contrast. He was a masterful teacher. He sets up this contrast. And he says, it's almost like the equivalent of a bar joke today. You know, uh, a Pharisee and a tax collector go to the temple to pray. Right? And he kind of sets it up. And you have to know, Pharisees in Jesus' day were, as I'm sure many of you know, very well respected. Like they knew their Bibles better than anyone. They followed all the rules to a T. Like if you wanted to know what did faithfulness look like, you looked to the Pharisees. Tax collectors were on the other end of the social spectrum. Tax collectors were those people who were just so easy to hate. They were punching bags. For a couple reasons. For starters, they were traitors. Tax collectors were Jews who, in a sense, became independent contractors of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire were those occupying the nation of Israel. They were the ones taking taxes. They were the pagan enemies of God. So people did not like the fact that Rome was in town taking their money. And they didn't like the fact that some Jews benefited from Rome. And so tax collectors were in bed with Rome. They, they were traitors, so no one liked them. Not only that, they were dishonest. And they would take more money, more taxes... Then, then they had to, and they got rich. And so you can begin to see why tax collectors were not, you know, going to be invited to the average dinner party. So here Jesus sets up this story. There's this Pharisee and this tax collector. They go to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee says this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, right? I mean, can you imagine if we prayed like that today? I mean, imagine if, I, if I'm up here and I'm like, God, oh, just thank you so much that, that I'm not like Paul. Or like, God, like, I, I read this and I think, this is hilarious. Like, I, I wonder if people laughed at this. I have no idea. Uh, but here's this guy praying, God, thank you that I'm not like these other people. Or even like this guy right here, this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. And then the lens shifts to the tax collector. And we're told the tax collector would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus is like, who's the hero of the story? Which one of these two goes home justified before God. Upon which one of these two does God smile? It's not the one who is so obsessed and distracted by the faults and failure of others. It's not the one who had a sort of spiritual and moral superiority complex. It's the one who would not even look up to heaven, cried out to God, and realized that he just needs God's mercy. Have mercy on me, God. A sinner. Jesus teaches us how to do it. And it's, it all has to do with where we're looking. Because the Pharisee was looking around him at all the other people. The tax collector was looking at himself. And I want to just pause this morning and ask the question, where are you looking this morning? Where are you looking? If you're married, are you the first one to say you're sorry? Even when you know, like when you, like deep down you know they're, they're wrong. Like, are you the first one to confess? In, in your relationships with family members, with friends, at the workplace. See, following Jesus involves an invitation to be the one who initiates. To be the one whose first word is that of confession. Whose finger is pointed toward oneself. This, Jesus says, is how we do it. What if we as Christians, 
Think about this. What if we as Christians became known for being slow to point the fingers at others instead of the other way around? What if we became known for being quick to own our own stuff? Because when you have a group of people with this sort of mindset, this sort of heart set, there's a ripple effect. It's peculiar in our culture. It's peculiar in such a way that draws people in. Uh, There was a book when I was in college that was very popular called Blue Like Jazz. I know some of you have read this book, Blue Like Jazz. There's a story in this book that I just love. uh, There's a college in Portland, Oregon called Reed College. And Reed College is notorious for being kind of ultra, it's in Portland, so ultra, ultra liberal, right? And there was a small group of Christians, clearly a minority, in, on this college campus. And, and, and Donald Miller, the author of Blue Like Jazz, tells this story so beautifully. And, and he said that this group of Christians really wanted to, to explore how in the world do we bear witness to Jesus in a place like this. Well, the, one thing you need to know about Reed College is every year they have something called a Ren Fair. A Ren Fair, and uh, short for Renaissance Fair. And it was basically a three-day celebration of debauchery. Every year after finals, it's just three days of mayhem and craziness. Uh, there's a, a lot of alcohol consumed on the campus. There's a lot of drugs, a lot of nudity. Well, that's not true. They paint themselves blue, so they have a layer of blue paint on, but it's just crazy. For three days, for three days, it's just nuts. The the school literally puts medics on campus during these three days because of drug overdoses and alcohol poisoning and whatever else. And here's this group of Christians asking the question, what would it look like for us to to be present at Ren Faire? Not not in such a way that, that compromises our convictions. Like, we want to be present as Jesus followers, but, but we want to participate. How might we participate? Not just as outsiders, but as true participants in this. What could we do? And one person came up with an idea. What if we built a confession booth? But this confession booth had a twist. It was a reverse confession booth. And this is how it worked. They, they literally built this, this building with a curtain in the middle of it. And there was a, one of them, uh, a Christian, sitting on one side. And someone, running around, having a good time, saw it. First person, this guy came in. And he said, uh, you know, it said confession booth on it. It's like, so, so how does this work? Do I just start telling you all my sins? And the other guy was like, well, first of all, Welcome. This is a confession booth. This is a place where confessions are heard. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to begin. And he said, you know, throughout history, there have been many, many horrible things done in the name of Jesus. There have been wars waged in the name of God. Think of the Crusades. Think of the Inquisition. I mean, think of the racism, the systemic racism that has been perpetuated by people who claim to be Christians. And he said, there have been horrible things done in the name of God, and, and, and those things make God's heart sad. They are not representative of who he is or who Jesus is. And yet, there, there have been Christians who have done such horrible things. And you know what? I'm, I'm one of them. I'm a Christian. And and I want to ask for your forgiveness. Will you, will you just forgive me, even just me, today? The guy who was sitting over there, he said, dude, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. And then there was this pause. And then he said, can I tell you some of my story? My dad used to beat me when I was little. And, and then out it came, pain, hurt, addiction, as he just poured out everything, right? And then, and then eventually he was done, and he left, and someone else came in. Hey, this is a confession booth, a place where confessions are heard, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to begin. 
right? <laughs> I had a very, very similar conversation, right? And, and this small thing, this small confession booth created a ripple effect on the campus. And this group began to host seminars, events, talking about issues like poverty. They, they started a homeless ministry. As a result of this, four Bible studies, were, Bible studies were immediately launched, and these Bible studies were mixed with people who were Christians and people who really, before then, didn't want anything to do with Jesus or the Bible. Do you see the power of when we just follow Jesus, when we listen to him, when we allow his words to have their way within us? Jesus teaches us how to do this. And I wonder this morning, how might he be inviting you to not judge? How might he be inviting you to do the difficult, uncomfortable work of examining your own heart? Of being the first to confess, the first to say, I'm sorry. Maybe you need to say you're sorry to someone today. Maybe you need to start a conversation. I, I don't know, but I do know that Jesus is inviting us to follow him in this way. Jesus clarifies for us what he means. He teaches us how to do it. But finally, he also models for us the way. In John 12, 48, Jesus profoundly says this, I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. Do you know, according to the gospel, like if the gospel is true, if the saving story of Jesus is true, then God, the creator of all things, he looks at you and he sees every dark corner of your heart. Like there's nothing he doesn't see. Even the things you've forgotten, like he sees it. And yet, when we look at Jesus, we see that this is a God whose first word to us, whose first word to you this morning, is not judgment. It's not condemnation. Now, there will come a time when God comes to judge the world, and frankly, what does our world need more than a good judge right now? Someone who comes and says, okay, we need to sort all this out. This needs to stop. This, right? So there will come a time. But God's word, his first word to us when we look at Jesus, is not one of judgment, it's not one of condemnation. It's one of embrace. It's one of forgiveness. It's one of invitation. And he's inviting you this morning to himself and to let him have his way with you. Will you respond to him this morning in some way? Whatever that means. Will you respond? I want to end this morning with, with a prayer. It's a short, guided prayer. And uh, it comes from Psalm 139. And what I'd like to do is just read one verse, but I'm going to read it slowly. And, and as I read each section, I want to invite you in your own heart and in your own mind to pray this with me. And to, to simply just listen. To pray and listen. Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. <clears throat> Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. and lead me in the way everlasting.
Father, we 